from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi, everyone. I'm Mark Sweeney, Director of Preservation at the Library of Congress, where our mission is to sustain the library's collections for future generations of users. Well, thank you for joining us for this final session in the graphic novels and science fiction tent today, um, where we'll hear from Jonathan Hennessy, author of two recent graphic novels dealing with American history and government. His first work, The United States Constitution, a graphic adaptation, and now his newest work, The Gettysburg Address, a graphic op uh, adaptation that he collaborated with his illustrator, Aaron McConnell, on uh, both of those works. I wanted to introduce Mr. Hennessy for three reasons. Uh, first was kind of a professional standpoint. I used to be responsible for the library's outstanding newspaper and comic book collection. Um, and of course, graphic novels are a natural outgrowth of those publications, um, so there's a good connection there. Second, um, I have a love of American history, and this being the year in which we're especially mindful of the Battle of Gettysburg, Lincoln's address, and Reverend King's marched last week in the, on the march in Washington, uh, I thought we've got something that we can really learn from this latest work of, um, on historical events. And then finally, it's a very personal thing. As the father of three young boys, uh, I know how hard sometimes it is to engage youngsters in reading, um, but really the illustrated uh, graphic novels open a really wide world for at least one of my sons. Um, and now, uh, going through this book, this latest book with him, it really has opened up um, the world of uh, history as well. So with that, would you please uh, welcome Jonathan Hennessy. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, yes, my name is Jonathan Hennessy. Thank you all for coming here today. And I want to I wanna thank you all for making a little space and your lives for the very boutique -y and esoteric pursuit of the nonfiction graphic novel, which is kind of a, uh, an uncommon and yet uh, rapidly multiplying invasive species in the uh, delicate ecosphere of comics and, and graphic novels. And while I'm doling out thanks to you all for being here, let me please take a moment to thank the Library of Congress for this excellent event, and particularly for noticing me in my little Gettysburg book. It's, a, it's an honor to be here, and um, anytime the Library of Congress comes calling, I will come running. I live on, I live on the West Coast, so I had that involved a, a fair bit of running. And it's so, it's so great to be here. And one last thing I want to say, as, as an adult, I'm very privileged to have lived in most of the places I've ever fantasized about living. I grew up outside of Boston, I've lived in New York City, I've lived in Texas, and I've lived a very decent chunk of my life now in Southern California. So the last place, like really one of the last places on the list is, is, is Washington. Washington is one of my favorite places to be. I feel like my own very moderate IQ ticks up a few points whenever I, I'm inside the Beltway, believe it or not. And I think one of my favorite things about Washington, which I've been seeing ever since I was a little kid and made my first visits here, is seeing so many people reading on the Metro. You know, I've been on my share of public conveyances around the world, and yet I still think when I come to Washington, I see more people reading on the train, particularly nonfiction, than anywhere else. So, like, my proverbial hat is off to Washington, Maryland, and Virginia for that. Um, okay, so now a little bit about the book. Um, obviously, this is the year 2013, and 2013 marks the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg and, of course, the Gettysburg Address, the Lincoln speech that came about five months later. Um, a few years ago, when this important uh, anniversary was still over the horizon, the editors at HarperCollins got together and decided that they wanted to release a, uh, they wanted to commemorate the anniversary with a truly original and dynamic work about the Gettysburg story to try to say something about it that had never been said before or to try to say it in some way that it had never been told before. And so HarperCollins started to cast around for the most, uh, for the most noted Civil War scholars and the most talented authors. They cast around for these people. Instead, what they ended up with was me. And what I gave them was my, my second uh, full-length book of graphic nonfiction, the first one being uh, an adaptation of the whole US Constitution, all seven articles and all 27 amendments. And this book very naturally grew out of that one, particularly on the subject of slavery. I didn't feel like in my US Constitution book I was able to give how much slavery has impacted American politics its due. And so this is kind of a, a, kind of a response to that. Um, 
So many of you will know that the Battle of Gettysburg took place over three days, July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863. And uh, such, such, a, such a colossal amount of, of fighting and devastation descended on this you know, small town in Pennsylvania from out of nowhere that when the two armies were departing, they left behind what was legitimately a huge humanitarian and, and public health crisis. The three days of fighting produced so many dead bodies on both sides that nobody really knew what to do with them. I mean, you can ask anybody in the Confederacy at the time, but in the 1860s and before, the federal government was not actually very big. It was not in the habit of uh, taking on big national scale projects. And, it, and besides that, it had this, this uh, unprecedented war going on between its own borders. So the, national, the federal government really could not respond very well to this, this public health crisis in Gettysburg. So it fell very heavily on the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and a number of other of, of, um, union states. So a conglomeration of union states got together to try to solve this issue. And what their solution was to build what they would call a soldier's national cemetery right at Gettysburg. So, these, so all these bodies would not have to be repatriated, tried to be identified and brought back to where they came from. Instead, they would build a, a, a beautiful, solemn, and, a, and a appropriate and kind of like, in terms of design, a cutting edge cemetery right there. So the, the work on the Soldiers National Cemetery in Gettysburg began in the weeks and months after the fighting. And then slowly winter began to set in and it became clear that the job of interring the bodies was going to have to end for the winter when the ground would be frozen. So the job came to consecrate the, the cemetery before, before it was done, before winter came in. And so uh, agents of the Pennsylvania governor, Andrew Curtin, um, sent out invitations to political luminaries, and one of the luminaries that they sent an invitation to was Abraham Lincoln, of course. Now, now today, we're used to the president running all over the country and indeed all over the world, giving speeches and trying to affect public policy and trying to affect uh, where the United States is going in the course internationally. But in the 19th century, the office of the president was considered far more august than it is, than it is today. Presidents, re it was very rare or at least uncommon for a president to appear to the public outside of Washington. And it certainly was not uh, Lincoln's, Lincoln's habit to go to every battlefield during the Civil War and give a speech afterwards. It was a very uncommon thing to do. But in the summer of 1863, despite the victory at Gettysburg and despite this concurrent victory in, uh, in Vicksburg, Mississippi, which happened at pretty much the same time. Things were not going well in 1863 for the, for the Union side militarily or for the Lincoln administration politically. I mean, despite the fact that there was this huge national, national crisis and that Lincoln was wielding these outside presi outsized presidential powers, because of that, the Constitution was still in effect and there would still be elections that very next year. And in the summer in 1863, and even months afterwards, things did not look very good for Lincoln. It, was very, it looked very unlikely that he would be reelected in 1864. As a matter of fact, some very close advisors of him said that he wouldn't even carry three states. So when Lincoln got this invitation to go to Gettysburg, for this and other reasons, he decided that he had, he had to respond. He had to go out to the public and make a, a public case as to why this you know, costly punishing war had, had to go on, in his opinion. So Lincoln took the, the Lincoln board a train for Gettysburg in mid-November. And by the when he arrived in Gettysburg, the job of interring the bodies was still only about one third done. And when he disembarked at the train station, there were still huge piles of coffins that were being brought into the city for use there. So um, Lincoln was a very judicious wordsmith. This is the story that we have that most people know about him writing the Gettysburg Address on an envelope in a flash of inspiration on the train is because there's no, it's completely apocryphal. There's absolutely no evidence to support that. And as a matter of fact, it would be starkly out of character for Lincoln. Um, for, I like to talk about how, you know, for poets and for lawyers, words mean everything. You change one little word of a, of a law or a contract and you're going to get very different results. So Lincoln was very judicious in drafting the Gettysburg Address. And it's actually a very short speech. When he finished giving it, there was, the story goes that there was no applause because people were startled that it was so short. He thought that it had made no effect, but it's very likely people just were surprised that he had completed speaking. Um, 
The Gettysburg Address is notable for many things, one of it being an, an incredible use of the English language, and another one being that it does a lot with very little. The Gettysburg Address is only about 270, 271 words, and it takes just a few minutes to recite. And yet it, it, it discusses all these giant themes of, uh, of American history. So when Lincoln was formulating the Gettysburg Address, he gave it this very elegant, and I call it sort of a chronological structure. The Gettysburg Address begins contemplating the distant past. It begins, you know, four score and seven years ago. And then it narrows to consider the present circumstances of the country in the Civil War. And then finally, it kind of narrows out again to contemplate the future. So it has this past, present, future um, structure to it. I call my book an adaptation of the Gettysburg Address because what I've tried to use that same chronology that Lincoln used to tell the whole story of the Civil War. So in my book, the Lincoln's speech, all the words are reproduced in here, but it's divided up into 17 different chronological sections. And I use that chronology to tell what I call the whole story of the Civil War, 1776 to the present. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, despite the pretty pictures in this book, thanks to my illustrator Aaron McConnell, and no thanks to me, um, that I, I, like, purport, I like to say that this book has something real to say about the Civil War. And that is that the Civil War began not in 1861, when it broke out as a shooting war, but the Civil War really began in 1776. In other words, um, what, I, what my book argues and what I believe that Lincoln knew and had very much in mind when he was writing the Gettysburg Address is that all the pieces of what would become the Civil War were already being put in place during the American Revolution and during the drafting and ratification of the Constitution. What I like to remind people in our country is that we have not one founding document, we have two. We have the Declaration of Independence and we have the U.S. Constitution. And any of, any of us can go down to the National Archives just a short distance from here and visit these two documents in person. They're under this beautiful rotunda in this very, in this very venerated space and these beautiful display cases. And the overall implication there is that these documents stand for the same things, that they're in harmony with each other, that they're the same set of ideas. But my, my experience um, researching these documents has led me to a completely different conclusion. That is that the, the Declaration of Independence and the US Constitution in four very discreet and powerful and dangerous ways were exact opposite. That in fact our two founding documents are in such conflict that they made the Civil War inevitable. They're both sets of American ideas, but they are not the same ideas. And so what I'd like to do now to follow up on on, on that provocative statement is show you four of these, four of the ways these two documents are in such conflict with each other. And then we're gonna focus, I'm gonna present to you the first chapter from my book, and we're gonna really dial in on one of those key differences and talk about and how that shaped the Civil War, how it shaped the secession movement, and how the Gettysburg Address is Lincoln's response to these truths. So, tensions between the United States Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, what are they? Slavery. The Declaration of Independence says that all men are created equal. The Constitution, on the other hand, in its original unamended formulation, allowed slavery to exist inside what's supposed to be inside the supreme law of the land in a supposedly free country, and as a matter of fact, had all kinds of concessions to slavery in our highest law on the land. Things like the, the Fugitive Slave Clause, things like the... Um, the, the to things like how uh, congressional representation is broken down with the three-fifths compromise, even things like why we have a bicameral Congress and, and, and uh, why we have an electoral college can be traced back to slavery. So all men are created equal or slavery is allowed to exist. Government power. The Declaration of Independence is arguably a generally small, small government document. I mean, if you think about it, the 13 colonies had just worked to throw off a, a distant powerful government. So the Declaration calls for something that's the exact opposite. They want not a distant, powerful government, but a weak, local government. The Constitution, on the other hand, begins to build up another centralized, distant government over the states. So the Constitution is generally a large government document. The Declaration of Independence is generally a small government document. The nature of rebellion. The Declaration of Independence is itself is a giant justification for rebellion. In the Declaration of Independence, if you, if you rebel against the government, it's the highest of patriotic acts. In the Constitution, if you rebel against the government, it's treason. 
And finally, the concept of state sovereignty. And this is what we're going to talk about in terms of the, the, the secession movement. In the Declaration of Independence, it says these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. It's really just 13 different countries. And then the Constitution doesn't really deal with the issue of state sovereignty at all, but it tries to amalgamate the states into a, into a nation, making them less like individual, individual states. So sovereignty is really the issue that we're going to tackle in terms of the Gettysburg Address and the Civil War in Chapter 1. And what we're going to do is we're going to ask, does the, dec does the ideas in the Declaration of Independence, do those ideas justify the secession of the Confederacy? Four score and seven years ago. Did the Confederacy have the right to secede? Did the U.S. government have the right to essentially force it at gunpoint to remain in the Union? First, we have to examine a deeper issue. So imagine you're taking a little quiz on the vital facts of the United States. What's its capital? What oceans are, are on its borders? How many states compose it? So these are questions about our country that have simple and definitive answers. But what about this question? So when, when precisely was the United States founded? Or to phrase this question in a more revealing way, when precisely was the Union founded? So come up with an answer for yourself, and we're going to kind of unpack that. It might be a more complicated question than you think. And profound consequences hinge on when you believe the Union was actually founded. The, the founding date determines the true nature of just what the United States or what the Union really is and whether or not secession might have been justifiable. So, okay, this question of the founding date. When did Lincoln think the Union had been founded? The opening phrase of the Gettysburg Address is Lincoln's answer. And, and with this answer, Lincoln sets out a very explicit and personal vision of what the Union is. Four score and seven years ago obviously refers to the year the Declaration of Independence was signed. 1776. Signing the declaration, I like to remind people, might as well have been signing a death warrant because any man putting his name to the document risked being executed as a traitor for the British crown. It was like signing your own death warrant, putting your name, come after me, I'm a traitor. But the patriots of 1776 were willing to stake their lives on their belief in popular sovereignty. So sovereignty is the issue of, of whom a civilization sees as, as its supreme earthly authority. And the sovereign wields power to rule the rest. Um, while the American people were under British rule, the monarch, the king or queen, was the sovereign. And what was the place of the, of the people in the monarchy system? They were British subjects, as in subject to the monarch's will. That's where we get the word subject, as in British subject. But by the 1770s, a critical mass of Americans had come to believe that this ancient monarchy system was corrupt, that it was unjust, and that it was unsupportable. So these defiant colonists renounced the rule of kings. They instead embraced the people as the rightful source of sovereignty. And this conviction inspired the American Revolution. This is a scene of the original reading of the Declaration of Independence and the first public reading in Philadelphia. So the Declaration of Independence is the fullest expression of the ideas behind the American Revolution. It rejects monarchy and enshrines popular sovereignty with the words, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. This is called uh, Jefferson's Doctrine of Consent. So to put another way, the idea is that only the people have the authority to create government and laws, and that no supposedly higher power, like a king or a dictator or a church figure, can rightly impose government on the people without their consent. So to Abraham Lincoln, the American people, who were very different groups of people scattered among very different colonies, they were first and foremost united by their devotion to these great principles. that men are capable of governing themselves through the power of reason, that men have essential human rights, and that men must be free from arbitrary government power. In other words, a, a government that they have no say in and no control over. So in, in Lincoln's mind, then, that's what the Union really is. That's what the United States is. 
It's the whole American people and their sacred bond to these principles, to this vision of humanity. So, and therefore, Lincoln would say that the Union was created in 1776. He actually said it was even predated the Declaration with the Articles of Association in 1774. So Lincoln would say that the Union came about when, the, when at the moment, Americans announced their revolutionary vision to the world. So when you're studying the Civil War then, remind yourself, every time Lincoln uses the word Union, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about these beliefs. He's not talking about a government, an alliance of states, even the Constitution. That's all very important, but in the back of Lincoln's mind, it's kind of beside the point. So, but the signers of the Declaration of Independence did not claim to represent the whole of the American people. They claimed instead to represent the people of the individual states. And, but Lincoln would still argue that the creation of the Union was an act of the whole American people because the beliefs that they held in common transcended the states where they lived in. But is, but is Lincoln's version the final word on when, the question of when and how the Union began? No. Not by a long shot. The Declaration of Independence declares not one, but many things. And like an enduring work of literature, some of those things remain open to interpretation. Despite Lincoln's personal vision, the Declaration says nothing about the great mass of American people forming a political union. Instead, it says the exact opposite. The Declaration says that Georgia, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and the rest are free and independent states. For example, free and independent states in international law have the authority to maintain their borders, write and enforce laws, and determine their own course of action in the world. So in the Declaration, each individual state is basically identifying itself as a country really no different from any other on Earth. Therefore, when Lincoln says the Declaration is the, is the founding moment of the Union, he's not necessarily on such firm ground at all. When did the secessionists think the Union was really founded? So many, many at the time of the Civil War and before it would have contended that the Union really began in 1788. That would be three score and 15 years ago when the U.S. Constitution was adopted or ratified. For only by adopting the Constitution did the states create anything like an actual national government. They'd had this thing, and many of you know, the Articles of Confederation, but that wasn't really quite a national government. It was so weak. It was really just an alliance. The Constitution was drafted by a small number of representatives from the states. And the document was not ratified in one big national vote. We still don't have any, many, many people would point out that there's still no operation in law that the whole American people are ever able to do. Everything is always broken up by the states. And the Constitution was ratified in separate elections held in the states. So the, so the, so the fate of the Union was really decided by the states, not the whole American people. So if you have this idea that the Union really dates from 1788, that gives us a radically different answer to the question of what the Union really is. Under that idea, the Union is just the states. It's a mutual political agreement, nothing more, nothing less. And it's certainly not Lincoln's mystical sense of a bond between people and a, and a philosophy. So this notion of a 1788 founding date also leads to another perplexing question one at the very heart of the secession crisis that led to the Civil War. So after they formed the Union, what happened to the state sovereignty? When they ratified the Constitution, did the states just sign their sovereignty away? Did they really agree to just give up this independence that they had so grandly and recently claimed in the Declaration of Independence? Uh, no, they didn't, would say many of the followers of Thomas Jefferson and the whole states' rights doctrine. Those who believe in states' rights assert that the sovereignty has always remained with the states. Jeffersonian thinkers argued that when they ratified the Constitution, the states merely lent out or delegated portions of their sovereignty to the federal government. Um, here's John C. Calhoun, an important figure in, the hist in, the, in the antebellum history. He put it very nicely. I go on the ground that this Constitution was made by the states 
that it is a federal union of the states in which the several states still retain their sovereignty. So why would these sovereign states delegate any of their sovereignty so that they could have at all? The answer is so that they could have the uh, benefit and convenience of sharing a federal government. An entity that would run the post office, help resolve conflicts among the states, and represent them around the world in diplomatically and militarily. So some would take the whole states' rights idea even further. And they construed that when the states ratified the Constitution, they were, the states were just making a, a contract or a compact. So according to compact theory then, the union is a creature or a puppet of the states. Uh, Littleton Tazewell, a former senator from Virginia, put this nicely. Governments are mere revocable procurations, simple delegations of limited and temporary authority executed by the sovereign people to accomplish certain purposes by certain defined means, nothing else. The people created our federal government and the creator must be superior to his creature. So under compact theory then, when, when the states made the federal government, it's just like you going out and hiring a lawyer, a banker, a, a public relations representative, and a bodyguard, agents that you hire to do certain things for you. And if you can hire these people, then logically you can fire them as well. So, it, so under the secessionist whole idea, if a state has the power to join the union, and enjoy the benefit of membership in the union, then the states logically also have the power to secede from the union if it decides those benefits have low value. Um, Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, put this very, very well. It is the inherent right of nations to disregard the obligations of compacts of all sorts by declaring themselves no longer bound in any way by them. And Jefferson Davis also said this, put it this way, among the delegated power of the US Constitution, there is none which interferes with the exercise of the right of secession by a state. And no matter where you stand on the Civil War, the Jefferson Davis is absolutely correct. So this is among the several ways the South justified secession. So these clashing interpretations of the Declaration of Independence, we have Lincoln's unionist position on one hand, we have the states' rights theory on the other hand. So these invite a debate not only about when the union began, but also a debate on who exactly declared the Declaration of Independence. John C. Calhoun again said, no such community ever existed as the people of the United States forming a collective body of individuals in one nation. And the idea that they are so united is utterly false and absurd. And in a way, legally, there's something to this. Because, like I said before, there's no operation in constitutional law that with the whole American people can do anything. And always, the, our elections, our state, it all comes down to the states. But Lincoln said in the first inaugural, the union is older than any of the states and, in fact, created them as states. So here you see very starkly these two completely different interpretations of when the union was founded and what the union is. And like I said before, but Lincoln would still say that these, the important thing is this belief in, in popular sovereignty and that these beliefs transcended the, uh, where people lived. Lincoln saw the states as something like an organizational framework for the people, not a collection of independent countries. And all unionists recognized that the states had power to govern their own domestic affairs, that is, to write and enforce fair state laws that affect only their part of the union, not the whole. So the loss of a state would affect the whole union. So therefore, under Lincoln's way of thinking, the states do not have the power of secession at will, this whole compact theory idea that the states can just are free to leave the union at any time. Lincoln said, no, no state upon its own mere motion can lawfully get out of the union. Plainly, the central idea of secession is the essence of anarchy. It's a little bit like agreeing to play a, a game or something, and as soon as the game doesn't go the way you want it to, trying to change the rules or just quit the game. That's kind of how, kind of how Lincoln saw it. But Lincoln, interestingly, never said that a state has no right to secede under any circumstances. 
hypothetically, you could still legally secede from the country even today if it was by some kind of extraordinary legislative action like the constitutional amendment process. So adding to this controversy, as Jefferson Davis pointed out, is that the Constitution is utterly silent on the subject of secession. It just doesn't deal with it at all. On the flip side, the Declaration of Independence, like we talked about, is by its very nature an argument in favor of secession, or perhaps more to the point, rebellion. Um, Great Britain didn't recognize that the uh, that there was any legal method for the 13 American colonies to break away. The rebelling colonists called on principles they considered higher than the laws of man. So, so pivotal to all these rights in the Declaration is this thing called the right of revolution. And these are words will be familiar to many of us. In the words of the Declaration itself, when any government becomes destructive of essential human rights, the people have the authority to alter or abolish that government and create a new one. Even Lincoln would have firmly defended that point. So secession was constantly defended by virtue of the right of revolution. The South was always pointing out that what they were trying to do was really no different from what the colonies had been trying to do in breaking away from Great Britain. So did the United States so persecute the South in the years leading up to the war that the Confederate States, did they fairly exercise their right of revolution? Uh, here's, here's some engraving, some copy in the, uh, this is the Confederate Soldiers Monument on the grounds of the State Capitol building in Austin, Texas. It says, died for state rights guaranteed under the Constitution. The people of the South, animated by the spirit of 1776, by their interpretation of the Declaration of Independence, to preserve their rights, withdrew from the federal compact in 1861, and the North, the North resorted to coercion. So plainly in the 1860s South, many in the South did think that their right of revolution was fairly justified. So a troubling legacy of the, of the Declaration of Independence then is that it makes the act of rebellion seem patriotic. So during the Civil War, many in the South secession as patriotism. And others saw secession as treason. So state sovereignty, secession, states' rights, and rebellion. Where you stand on these contentious issues comes down to whether you believe the Union was formed in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence or in 1788 with the Constitution. The two documents, they inseparably make up the intellectual foundation of the United States, yet in these meaningful ways they are polar opposites. These contradictions are like, they're like self-destructive flaws that are encoded in the ideological DNA of the United States. So who do we blame for our founding documents not being in concert with each other? Um, like I said, my book argues, and I think Lincoln believed this too, that these differences in our two founding documents made the Civil War inevitable. So who do we blame for that? So we have to lay, we must lay our blame at the rest, at the feet of the men Abraham Lincoln refers to in the next passage of the Gettysburg Address, our fathers. And so that's the end of chapter one, and chapter two goes on to look at why is this the case that our two founding documents are so different. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. So I'll take any questions. If anybody has any, I will try to answer any questions. Yes, sir. But yeah, I still have a question. So we still really oh. are in the same situation. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't understand that there was, this is my fault. I didn't understand that there was a microphone set up. So let me take the gentleman in the red first since he's at the microphone. Thank you, sir. We'll get right to you next. Okay. Well, so we're still in the same situation now. We still don't, we, with state rights for different, well, with gay marriage and different things. So. Really, we still haven't solved anything, even from the Civil War <laughs> to now. So the question is, 
with your study, have you really seen anything that really gives us a really a good definitive answer that we can say, okay, the federal government is right for one thing and the, and the state's rights are right for another? So does it actually show from your study, can you actually find anything that points a finger right at where we are, where we can actually see? No, absolutely not. As a matter of fact, what the book argues is that the Civil War which had to be fought to try to reconcile these differences in our founding documents, the Civil War did manage to resolve several of them. It resolved slavery for all times. It resolved to a certain degree, although there might be a minority of people who disagree with this, but, but legally, and the Supreme Court has touched on this also, it solved the state sovereignty issue. There's Texas v. White is a 19th century, and, uh, after the Civil War Supreme Court case that said that essentially that a state could still legally secede by constitutional amendment. So the, the, the slavery issue was resolved. The, the state sovereignty issue was, re, was resolved. Even the rebellion, um, the nature of rebellion issue was resolved. But that government power, what's the correct size and scope of the federal government, was absolutely not resolved. And one of the reasons that we still have so much political conflicts today is because we have these very uniquely American ideas that are not in, they're not, they're not in harmony with each other. But you must have said this, that the Declaration of Independence clearly says that each of the states that are now independent have all the rights that Great Britain does. So that meant you are creating 13 totally independent sovereignties, but every July 4th, we celebrate the founding of the United States of America. That's a big contradiction. Yeah, like I said, Lincoln's, Lincoln's vision of what the Union is is a very personal vision for him. And, it's, and when you really look at the law and the language of these documents, it's, it's kind of hard to agree with Lincoln. However, there is a third sort of way to look at this, and that would be that when the states ratified the Constitution, there is a way of saying that... that um, they then transferred their sovereignty to the, to the federal government, that they became a nation by ratifying the Constitution, but that's still a contentious issue also. I go along with that, but then you'd say the founding of the United States of America is with the Constitution and not the Declaration right. of Independence. And that's why my book spoils Fourth of July for everyone forever after. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, I recall a quote from Winston Churchill about dealing with Americans during World War II. They said, America will get everything right after exhausting all the other possibilities. <laughs> so in the light of that, what about the practical issues that came up with the Constitution? I mean, this, the Confederation wasn't working, right? The states were broke. They, they were, I read somewhere that Pennsylvania was convinced New York was going to invade them. So it, looking, you think of it in terms of Winston Churchill, they were just practical problem solvers and not so much caught up, although we dress it up as we should in the mm -hmm. greater issues. Do you deal with, with that question at all? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 the question is, uh, was, when, was, the, was the drafting of the Constitution just a way of solving the pragmatic issues? There is an extended sequence in my book, I believe it's actually in this next chapter now, that talks about all the various crises that the, that the, that the government was facing under this you know, preposterously weak government that we had under the Articles of Confederation. That yes, there were, there were bloody skirmishes between the states, that Vermont seceded from the state of New York and government was powerless to do anything about it. And that um, Spain seized control of the Mississippi River. And you know we had defeated the Great Britain in the Revolutionary War, but that didn't mean that redcoats were not just lurking on the borders, ready to come in the second this grand experiment fell apart. And in those first seven years, it very much looked like, like that was going to happen. So the drafting of the Constitution was, in a way, done under these emergency, dire circumstances. I mean, I think there's even a story in North, in North Carolina, or it may have been Georgia, when the state, when the state convention was, was debating whether to ratify the Constitution or not, there were Indians marching on where they had met 
and they had to hurry to get out of there or to, to, to defend themselves from the, from the impending attack. So that is really how dire it was. And in my opinion, that's why these conflicts still, still exist, because they didn't have time when they were ratifying the Constitution to work out all these details. And many people just didn't want the details worked out. You never would have... You never would have gotten all the states to sign on if you had addressed some of these issues. They were just too sensitive. Yes? My question is shifting gears a little. Um, you've clearly done a ton of research on this and are very passionate about it. How did you come to do all of this? Um, how did, the question is how I came to do all of, all of this. Well, like I said, it was, it was f sort of leaving this, having this, this, this uh, feeling after I'd finished the Constitution book that it hadn't adequately dealt with the, with the issue of slavery. And so I started, I started to look around for uh, a way to have a, a, a proper response to that rather than just doing something like uh, a graphic history of slavery, which, you know, which I could have done. But when I, was, when I started to realize this thing about the difference between the uh, Declaration of Independence and the US Constitution, and the Gettysburg Address is very specifically formulated to, to address these issues, so it seemed like a natural fit for it. And it did take uh, a ton of research to make this, make this book possible. I mean, what I like to remind people is that, is, is that we have more than one Civil War book for every day on the calendar since the Civil War ended. And the, and, the, and, this, and the number one person most written about in the English language is Jesus Christ, but the number two person is Abraham Lincoln. So to try to say anything original w about the whole thing was, uh, was, was practically impossible. So it took a great deal of research and this eureka moment of breaking up the Gettysburg Address. I mean, many, many great books have been written on the, on the Gettysburg Address, and my book wouldn't exist without without Gary Wills and Gabor Boritz's um, earlier, earlier works. But I don't think anybody has thought before of breaking it up and using that same chronology to tell the whole story. Yes? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. From the point of view of a graphic novel, um, did you find the artist or did the publisher assign one like a children's book typically works? And oh, can you repeat the question, sir? <clears throat> How did it work as a graphic novel? Did you find the artist, or did the publisher put you together? Oh yeah, in this in this case, um, I had met Aaron McConnell years earlier, um, working on a, a very a very different type of uh, type of project that involved um, historical stuff. And we had done we had made a kind of like small unpublished work before we before our constitution idea materialized. And then um, we were able to we were able to make a publishing deal with the idea for the for the constitution. And Aaron will I'm very happy to say will be illustrating uh, my third book, my third nonfiction graphic novel which will come out next year which is a history of beer because I had to take a break from the very depressing <laughs> politics and war. One last question. Hi there, and I'll disclose to the audience that I'm a longtime friend of the author. <laughs> um, so could you say a little bit about the graphic novel aspect? Of it? So we've talked a lot about the history of it, but how does the graphic novel format change the way you talk about the issues or which em issues to emphasize? Mm -hmm. Well, it would have, it, 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 another direction that you could have gone with these same ideas is just to write a traditional prose book. On, on these same ideas, but there's like a there's a I believe that there's a, a very powerful alchemy when you use the words and pictures together. You can you can cover a lot of ground. Um, the book, like I like to say, tries to do many things. In some ways, it's almost a, a walking tour of of Washington D.C. itself because it figures this recurring character who begins looking at the two documents in the National Archives and then walks all over the city thinking, you know, standing before the Jefferson Memorial, standing before the Lincoln Memorial, standing before the Thurgood Marshall Judiciary Building. And we never know exactly what this character thinks, but we sort of, she's there to sort of for us to project on, you know, what can she possibly be thinking with this, uh, all this burden of history on someone like this character. And that's something that would have been impossible or I can't think of as a writer anyway to do it in a, in a typical prose book. And also because this, this book is able to jump back and forth in time so much. It, 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 it begins, like I said, in really colonial or pre-colonial times and goes all the way through the Civil War, through the Battle of Gettysburg, all the way through Reconstruction. And with that, you know, styles change, architecture changes, everything about everything. So that imagery, it's able to uh, make great use of, of the imagery as a sort of time travel, as a sort of an experiment in time traveling itself. I've been told I'm over time. So thank you again all, and uh, thank you Library of Congress. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.